Marcus Brown is asking, if you were starting your novel writing career nowadays, would you pursue traditional print publishers, self-publishing, or a hybrid approach, and why? Well, actually, I uh, uh, have always thought of myself as being a, a doing print publishing, and I, I don't pay too much attention to doing anything that would go specifically to, to electronic publishing because, in fact, the publisher does that for us. Uh, I write a book that is designed to go, in my mind, in a, in a regular hardcover novel. Uh, as it happens, I simply translate that into an electronic format, and, uh, and it works quite well, at least it has so far. Now, one of the things that I've thought about doing is I'm not coming out with a uh, Virgil Flowers book this fall. It instead will be replaced by a science fiction novel. Uh, but I know that a lot of people like Virgil Flowers uh, novels, and what I have thought about doing is writing a number of Virgil Flowers short stories, uh, very short stories, maybe two, 3,000 words long, not long at all, uh, just little quick images of Virgil, and uh, having you, Roz, uh, format them for uh, iPhones and for other telephones, so that these could be read on buses and stuff, and, and just looked at on your telephone. Uh, and also, you know, download it electronically and do it for free, because because I really value my uh, Virgil Flowers uh, uh, fans. So, I don't know if that will happen, because right now I'm pretty jammed up in the writing, but I'd like to do that. Uh, and those will be the first things that I've ever written that I have thought in advance were designed for electronic media. Um, I don't, the question isn't so much about the electronic media as the, for, as the publishing houses, uh, I think, where they're saying Putnam versus self-publishing. Because with Amazon, now a lot of writers who want to be published but who can't get a major contract or who don't know the process can release a book themselves through Amazon and get something like 40% or half of the, um, of the gross of it. Um, so that's the that's it's kind of, it's that's the new self publishing model. Yeah, but the problem with self publishing, and there are problems with self publishing. There are a few people who've broken through into um, into you know bestseller them or what would amount to bestseller. I, I know one of them actually. Okay. She wrote some books, and now she's being actually uh, represented by Atria, I think. Right, but the point is, is that there are very few of them, and one of the things that a publishing house offers you are access to publicity, uh, access to sales force access to people who go out and hustle the books for you. Uh, and all that disappears if, editors. You, if, you, if you editors, and if you, if you self-publish, all that disappears. Uh, I have no problem with people who self-publish, but that's not what I do. I like to write. I don't want to be my own sales force. I just don't want to do that. And um, there have been a number of extremely successful books, uh, especially in the YA field, the young adult field, where the author of the books established a very powerful online presence before he wrote the book. Uh, and that worked out for them very well. That's just not something I do. Because in fact, uh, as you know, Roz, yeah. uh, everything I know about Facebook could be written on the back of a postage stamp. Yeah. I do not know how to do anything on Facebook except post. Uh, I don't know how to friend people. I don't know how to, to respond to people who are my friends. Uh, last night, for the first time in history, I actually made a comment on my son-in-law's uh, uh, page. And I wasn't sure that that was actually going to happen, uh, but it did happen because, because he replied. And um, I said, what kind of Mustang was John Wick driving? And he came back and he said, I think it was a 69. All right, that's the first time I've ever successfully transferred a thought to somebody else on Facebook because I knew nothing about it. And quite frankly, I really don't want to know much more than, than, than being able to post and then being able to read the comments from the readers, which I do read and, uh, and, and will occasionally reply to because I also don't know how to push the reply button sometimes. Lisa Buckley wanting to know, will Shrake and Jenkins ever get their own book? They deserve it, and they are so much more than just the muscles of BCA. Well, they are, but the problem is I'm not sure that they're stars. Uh, I can't really answer the question, though, because that's an interesting concept that I hadn't really considered before. Uh, Jenkins and Shrek are good, solid characters. Um, uh, they're actually based on two guys who were friends of mine. One of them has passed away. Uh, but I have fun with it, because Dan Jenkins, a uh, famous sports writer, uh, has been to every uh, Masters tournament for more than 50 years now. 
He's in his 80s, I believe. And uh, the thing about Dan is that he's a little heavy set. Uh, he smokes, or he used to smoke a lot. Uh, you rarely see him without a cigarette. Uh, and he'd like occasional cocktail or two, or three or four or five or six. Uh, and uh, so naturally, in the book, Shrink is the one who is the sprinter and always runs people down. Uh, so I'm having fun with the characters because I know the guys and and uh, I enjoy doing that kind of thing. But whether or not they ever show up in a not in their own novel, I just don't know. Sort of a mild spoiler, but not exactly mild spoiler. Do you think they're going to start showing up more in the Virgil models now? Yeah, they probably will because uh, Lucas has uh, left the BCA with my last book. Uh, I am not going to have him working for another agency for a while. Then uh, uh, Virgil is going to be carrying the torch for the uh, Bureau of Criminal Apprehension for now on. Uh, he's going to have some of the same problems that Lucas has with, uh, with uh, the BCA bureaucracy. Which is sort of made up. BCA is pretty much pretty pretty good guys. Yeah. Uh, so I made that up a bit. But uh, uh, Jenkins and Shrek, as kind of mainstays of that whole group, along with Dell, will probably be showing up in the Virgin Bottoms a little bit more than they have been. Claudine Bigelow wondering, do you use a computer to type out your novels or an old school typewriter? I use a computer. Uh, I started using computers uh, back in the 1970s, actually in the middle 70s, when we, when we worked off of a mini computer, where we actually had to go back and reboot it with paper tape. Uh, that's how long I've been using computers. Uh, I never knew much about them except for the word processing programs. And that's about all I do now is word processing and, and a certain amount of Googling and, and you know, browsing the web. Um, I, I don't really know a lot about them, but I've used them for a very long time, and they're 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 much more versatile and agile than a computer was, or the, excuse me, than a typewriter was. Um, I did use typewriters for a while, where you uh, use an IBM Selectric, and you would you would type the uh, story, the newspaper story, on paper, and then you would run the paper through a scanner that would scan it and would put it into uh, the computers that were being used by the copy this, but that was only for a short time. I've almost always written on computers. Do you know anyone who still writes on a typewriter? I mean, they're kind of they're they're sort of hard to find in a way. Uh, there are a few people, and in fact, I think I saw one on television. I couldn't tell you who it was. Not long ago, uh, a guy who supposedly still types on a typewriter. Uh, There's a I, science fiction author, I, I think it might be Ben Vogel, but I'm not sure, who actually, he hates computer typewriters, he, or computers for writing, he only uses a typewriter, and it struck me strange because he's a science fiction guy, you think he'd get out of the curve with it, but... You know, a lot of science fiction guys struck me as being uh, sort of traditionalist. When, when I've got a book that, that shows pictures of science fiction writers at home, and uh, they were not high tech people, according to these, uh, to, you know, to the uh, to, to this picture book that I saw. Yeah. So the photography book. Brian Kenny uh, saying, throughout many of the prey novels, Lucas hints at knowing what it's like to have a history of depression, though the references are often cryptic. Seems to me the interest uh, this interests me as a registered therapist. Were your the references depression deliberately vague, and if so, why? Uh, because I just don't want to dwell with it. Uh, I personally uh, experienced a fairly serious depression about 20 years ago, something that I'm not going to go through again. And uh, I use a lot of aspects of my own life and Davenport's life uh, uh, because it, you know it's good material. Uh, I also uh, am a little bit of a campaigner for people understanding that depression is not being bummed out. Uh, it's not just feeling bad or feeling down. Uh, there, there is a, uh, a book about depression, uh, and I'm blanking on the title right now. Darkness Visible. Darkness Visible. Uh, it's a memoir of a guy who suffered serious depression, and uh, he says that, that uh, the depression should be, be called brainstorms, because it's not that you're bummed out, it's that because your brain has got bad chemicals in it, and your brain begins to spin around and you can't stop it. 
Uh, you can't sleep at night. Uh, the brain is crowding in on you all the time. It drives, literally drives you crazy. Uh, people try to treat it by, by drinking too much, by taking large doses of drugs and everything else. And I, and I, I like to refer to that to show the guy who is, in other ways, uh, a perfectly sane and rational guy has this fear of a mental disability that may be out there. Okay. Um, here's a strange question. This relates uh, to me because, well, to me, you, and because our entire family has a history, I think, of mild depression. Um, did you find that when then when you left Minnesota that a lot of it cleared up? Because when I moved from Minnesota to California, I think that fully half of my depression was seasonal affect. Well, uh, seasonal uh, affect disorder, affects disorder. Itself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is real, and it happens to me. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was so noticeable in me that I had once had an editor who put on her calendar every February, kick Camp's ass, because Camp wouldn't work in February because he'd be too bummed out for work. And so she'd know that right around the 1st of February, she'd have to come out and kick my ass a little bit to get me to do my job. Uh, otherwise, I would just sit there in the, in the chair and stare at the ceiling. Um, and I always felt better for that, for actually going out and doing stuff, forcing myself to go out and do it. But I don't know if I would have done it on my own. Well, you have to force yourself to do it, and you wouldn't, and you don't want to force yourself to do it. Yeah, you, you don't want to do anything. You pretty much just want to, you know, eat, eat Cheetos and watch television. Uh, and the thing is, is that, is that uh, she, but with me, the disorder was so clear that she said that every time she got a new calendar, you know, on January 1st, She'd flip over the pages to put in her regular stuff, and she would write Kit Camp's ass on February 1st. Did it clear up when you went to California, when you went to New Mexico? Because for me, it totally did. I think it did. I think it did clear up a bit. Uh, I, I didn't feel it this year. Uh, but part of the fact is, is that since I went to live for a while in California the winter time, for a few years, and uh, New Mexico, is I haven't had time for any kind of disorder like that because I've just been working like a dog. And uh, uh, for the last three years, I've written three books a piece, three books a year, uh, one of them with my wife, uh, and, and it's a very complicated, busy existence. So, and, and I think that when you get that busy, you might not notice the part of the time you're depressed.